Hello everyone, glad to be back. Today is 8th of uh, August, now it's 15 past 1, middle of the day by Moscow time. I'm Levan Gudadze and this is my first update for the day in which I will share all the main news that are making headlines in Russian media outlets and Russian language pages for this moment. Second update will be a little bit late in the afternoon on my Patreon page in which I will share additional news that will be reported by Russian media. As many of you know, I do extra content for Patreon on a regular basis in attempt to generate additional interest among members of our community towards my Patreon and uh, I will be immensely grateful if you will consider to join our tiny community um, there. You will see a link to my Patreon under this video in the description box or in the pinned comment. That's been said, let's talk about news now and uh, I will start today with uh, with the uh, uh, 2008 uh, short military conflict uh, between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Georgia. Worldwide, it's known as a uh, uh, war that began on 8th of August, August 15 years ago. And by the way, uh, if I may, I will take a couple of minutes and I will share with you my take on what uh, did happen then during those uh, four uh, crucial uh, critical four or five days from 8th or 7th of August uh, up to uh, 12th, 13th of August uh, and uh, what was consequences. And by the way, uh, when it comes to that conflict, uh, I'm quite sure uh, at the time president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili and his uh, inner circle, his government was acting uh, on behalf of uh, US neocons and the CIA uh, and uh, I believe they have orders to provoke conflict to reignite civil war in soft Ossetia and provoke Russia to enter this conflict and uh, I'm 100% sure main goal for uh, uh, US neocons and CIA to give such order was that uh, they wanted to break apart this uh, triangle that was building between uh, in the early years of 2000s between Russia, Germany and France. And by the way, if you check media reporting of that time, since 2000 and uh, since 2000 to 2005, 2007, you will clearly see that uh, Moscow, Paris and Berlin were becoming very close to each other and I'm 100% sure it was a, a significant, uh, significant problem or issue for uh, Washington and London. And uh, well, they come up, I guess, with a plan to not just uh, break up that triangle Russia, France, Germany, but also to begin demonizing Russia to distance entire Europe from uh, Russia. And the first stage of that plan was uh, 2008 war. They give Saakashvili order to provoke military conflict with Russia and he did execute that order quite well. Unfortunately, unfortunately for me, unfortunately for uh, all uh, Georgians and uh, Ossetians or just all, all Russians. And uh, what happened is that uh, on uh, Saakashvili's regime uh, did begin preparations to uh, conduct military operation or reignite civil war in South Ossetia. And by the way, before two, 2008, relationship between Ossetians and Georgians in this region in South Ossetia, which is here, by the way, relationships were quite good despite many years of confrontations uh, previously since the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, for, for that moment, um, relationships were quite good and uh, but, but uh, Saakashvili was acting under orders of his uh, uh, US masters and uh, he began prepar preparation of uh, ground for military actions. In 2008, in 2006, I come back to Georgia from England, where I was living for uh, quite a few years. 
and basically i did notice straight away that uh, regime controlled media was pushing extremely hard this narrative of uh, uh, military actions narrative of nece necessity of military actions to re retake uh, control or regain control over the south ossetia or abkhazia which is uh, here by the way and which is also was uh, just partially controlled by Tbilisi at the time. And when I say partially, it was only uh, basically one canyon area in mountain area here, uh, which was um, which was controlled by Tbilisi. The rest of the Abkhazia was uh, controlled by Abkhazian forces. And Russian peacekeepers were located in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia, and Tbilisi was agree on that. And what happened is that uh, Tbilisi was pushing this uh, war narrative on society, and you could see almost on a weekly or at least monthly basis this false uh, social studies uh, that according to which majority of uh, Georgians were thinking or supporting military actions to be taken for um, establishing control over the separatist regions. Uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and it was false. I'm 100% sure it was false because I was communicating with people and I did not see that many citizens of Georgia that were very keen to start uh, war or restart, uh, reignite civil war in uh, in South Ossetia or Abkhazia. But as, as I said, Saakashvili has its orders. He did prepare ground for military actions and he began conducting provocations uh, at least, at the latest, uh, if, if, if we uh, uh, go back to history, he was uh, under his orders, provocations were taken in the direction of South Ossetia, even in the spring of uh, 2008, earlier than that, we can say. But on 7th of August, on 7th of August, approximately 11.30 in the afternoon, uh, Saakashvili give order to Georgian military to open massive uh, fire in the direction of uh, Tsinwali, capital of South Ossetia, in the direction of other settlements that was under control of uh, local authorities, Ossetian authorities. And uh, this was, uh, by the way, streamed live on major TV channels. This massive uh, fire in the direction of uh, in the direction of uh, South Ossetia settlements and uh, by the way in georgia at the time as i said it was uh, 11 30 in the in the evening approximately but in russia because of difference in time time zones in russia in in moscow for example it was uh, already 8th of august that's why worldwide this conflict is known as a conflict that began on 8th of uh, august and well that's why i'm commenting today on on this uh, topic and i did not say uh nothing yesterday although I, I could talk about it yesterday also but let's go back to main topic and uh well uh, on 8th of uh, august uh, all the officials of sagashvili um, his government were uh quite keen to state during the talks with journalists that Russian forces are not engaging in this conflict. And that was happening on 8th of August. As I said, Georgian forces opened fire uh, late after evening of uh, 7th of August. And on 8th of August, at least a um, good uh, half of the day, Georgian officials, officials of Saakashvili's regime, were constantly stating that Russian forces are not engaging, Russian peacekeepers are not engaging in, in, in the battles. And that was not good enough for Saakashvili because, as I said, his orders, in my understanding, was to provoke Russia. And to achieve this, uh, what happened next is that uh, fire was uh, provoked between uh, Georgian forces and the uh, Russian peacekeepers. And because peacekeepers had uh, only light military equipment, they were lightly armed, 
uh, they stood no chance against uh, motorized uh, brigades of uh, Georgian armed forces and basically uh, Russian peacekeeper uh, bases of Russian peacekeepers were obliterated and the uh, Russian side lost uh, many many uh, peacekeepers during this attack and by the way this was an act of war I'm 100% sure Saakashvili and his uh, associates provoked this direct clash between Georgian forces and peacekeepers to make sure that Moscow will have no chance to refuse openly entering the conflict that was the only reason why fire was open in direction of uh, Russian peacekeepers and uh, of course Moscow did react as uh, as any country would react in that in, in such a, a situation because attack on the peacekeepers is an act of war and uh, and uh, later that day on 8th of August and since the 9th of August Russian forces were actively engaged in um, in battles all around the South Ossetia and the Russian Air Force were striking bases of uh, Georgian forces uh, all around uh, Georgia. So that's how conflict was provoked between uh, uh, Georgia and Russia by Saakashvili's uh, regime, who is, by the way, right now in jail in Georgia and should stay in jail, that mass murderer and war criminal, should stay in jail for all the evil that he did to Georgia, Georgian people, Ossetian people, to everybody. And his associates should be in jail also uh, for all the crimes that they committed. But uh, let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about um, main main topic. And yes, that's that's how this uh, plan was implemented against Russia by Washington and the London to somehow destroy this triangle Moscow between Russia, France, and uh, Germany, and and began distancing Europe from Russia by demonizing Russia. And if you remember the, those times, Western media was uh, in 24-7 regime. Uh, all day, every day was reporting that it was Russia that unprovokedly start this uh, war against Georgia when true was completely different. Uh, I believe uh, I believe uh, majority of Western society even now have no idea that Saakashvili's regime did open fire on Russian peacekeepers, which is act of war, by the way. Uh, no other inter interpretation can be given to, to such a uh, action. But uh, by the way, that was, as I said, the first stage um, of this uh, big plan of uh, Washington and London. And of course, second stage of that, that operation was uh, 2014 in Ukraine, when uh, with the active uh, support of uh, US, uh, extremist forces in Ukraine take, uh, uh, conducted the uh, armed coup, basically and uh, and uh, force president democratically elected president at the time Yanukovych to flee country and regain control over the Ukraine and then we all see that in after that uh, civil war began in uh, eastern regions of Ukraine at the time in Donbass and Russia was forced basically to take action and establish control over the Crimea, which did uh, happen. That was, uh, uh, that was, uh, I believe, a super, super operation that was conducted by Russian side to establish control over the Crimea, basically without any bloodshed. Uh, but but as I said, uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, regional conflicts they are uh, not uh, coincidence. Uh, they are plans. They are part of the plan that was uh, generated by Washington mainly and uh, and uh, London. And by the way, since 2014, of course, Washington was uh, and, and under orders of Washington, all the NATO member states were pouring in weapons in um, 
Ukraine in, and they were actively supporting this uh, neo-Nazi regime and terrorist regime in Kyiv and uh, well they did manage to provoke conflict with uh, with uh, Russia and Ukraine in 2022 when Russia basically had no other options other than act again but as I said, this is all a part of a bigger geopolitical uh, plan that uh, Western true rulers of the Western world had and uh, began to implement um, 15 years ago in 2008 by provoking military conflict between Georgia and Russia. And by the way, you probably already all are informed that uh, after that conflict, Russia, Russia did make decision to recognize independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and establish military bases there to, to make sure that uh, Tbilisi will uh, never again, whoever is in government in Tbilisi, uh, they will never ever try to uh, reignite conflict in, in, in those directions. And because of that recognition, now Moscow and Tbilisi are in finding difficult to reestablish uh, relationships. But if you ask me, I believe, I believe uh, there is a chance, there is a chance that Tbilisi, Tsinwali and Sukhumi can uh, conduct negotiations and come up with, uh, come to uh, agreement that uh, it may be best for all the sides to uh, unite in a confederative state in confederation with the uh, with the security guarantees for south uh, ossetia and abkhazia with security guarantees from uh, from moscow many details can be worked out um, it will not happen in a day of course but i believe uh, uh, despite difficulties uh, this is the right way to go to reunite in confederative uh, state and uh, this uh, this way, uh, basically, and I believe Moscow would not be against it because uh, it will uh, it will res resolve uh, many issues uh, between Tbilisi, for example, and and Moscow because Moscow cannot uh, take back its recognition of uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But if uh, if this uh, if Tsinwali, Sokhumi, and Tbilisi will decide to re uh, reunite in a new confederative state then Moscow will just recognize that new state and that's it really. And, uh, and Tbilisi can uh, begin its relationships with Moscow with, uh, with, with clean sheet, uh, let's say. So that's, that's my, my take. That's my take on, on, on this uh, conflict. Today, I believe many channels will remember that conflict of 2008 and uh, uh, I think it was uh, necessary for me to also say a uh, few words about it well uh, this video is already 18 minutes so I will just go through some headlines now that are, are uh, relevant in Russian media and Russia right now and uh, and uh, Maybe I will I will record second update for for main channel also today to make sure that uh, I will highlight all the main topics that are making headlines in Russian media and Russia. So let's let's talk about news now. And uh, well, first of all, quick summary of the situation on the front line in Ukraine. It's uh, still operational pause all along the front line. That's uh, how I'm gonna uh, call it. When it comes to Kherson region, it's. Uh, uh, artillery duels between the sides uh, and um, and wrecking operations of course uh, constant uh, clashes local scale clashes between the sides to uh, establish control over the, these uh, small islands in the Dnepr river and by the way we had reports this morning that during the previous night Ukrainian forces did try to conduct some landing operation uh, landing operation in direction of this settlement Kazachi Lagiri here but uh, Ukrainian boats uh, it was two speed boats they were uh, uh, find 
by Russian Recon uh, teams and the fire was open in the direction of those uh, boats. They were destroyed and uh, according to Russian sources, none of the Ukrainian soldiers did made it to, to the left bank of the Dnieper River. Yet another suicidal operation of Ukrainian forces in this um, sector, which is not unique by the way. Ukrainian soldiers are forced to conduct this suicidal operation all along the front line when it comes to Zaporozhye and the South Donetsk sectors uh, of the of the front main hot points of course uh, still are Rabotina southern on the southern side of uh, Orekhov city and uh, uh, during the previous 24 hours we did had uh, reports that were kind of contradicting each other at one hand Ukrainian forces try to conduct yet another this frontal suicidal uh, offensive operations and uh, according to data that we are receiving yet another military uh, groups of ukrainian forces were uh, destroyed during that uh, offensive and uh, we also have reports that uh, russian side also began its uh, local scale offensive operations in this uh, uh, sector in this uh, area of this sector of the front and they did manage to regain control over the some territories that previously was held by ukrainian forces but overall it's still local level skirmishes between the side local uh, local scale battles which are not really influencing overall situation on this sector of the front and by the way there were some um, uh, clashes in um, uh, direction of pichikhatki Jiribyanki also, but yet again, only local scale skirmishes and uh, reckon operations. When it comes to um, uh, Removsky ledge in South Donetsk sector of the front line, situation is a little bit different. As I reported during the previous days, Ukrainian forces did uh, deploy additional troops in this direction and they uh, resumed their offensive in direction of uh, Stara Mayorska Urajaina and uh, according to latest news they even did manage to enter uh, Urajaina from the northern flank and if it's true and if uh, this settlement is uh, undefendable for, from from Russian standpoint or if 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 it um, if defense of this settlement will require heavy casualties from Russian side I believe uh, uh, leadership of Russian group of forces in this area will make decision to withdraw forces from Urajaina because uh, this settlement can be retaken in you uh, know when time is uh, right again uh, but uh, uh, lost soldiers cannot be uh, bring to life so I believe if uh, this settlement is undefendable Russia will conduct yet again Russia will demonstrate this mobile defense and mobile warfare tactics and uh, forces will be withdrawn from uh, Urajaina on the next line of uh, defense but yet again yet again let's see let's see how the situation develop today and tomorrow as you remember situation was quite difficult uh, in uh, Bakhmut direction in in, in around settlement uh, Klishevka also recently and I did not I, I even did uh, uh, said that maybe Russian forces will withdraw if it's necessary, if this uh, village is undefendable. But uh, looks like Russia did, Russian side did had uh, good enough positions in that settlement, and they did not withdraw. Uh, they just uh, wait for a day or two uh, when uh, Ukrainian forces did run, run out of steam, and then Russian side began its offensive operations in that area, and the initiative is totally in, on Russian side now on the southern flank of Bakhmut in Klishevka, Kurjumoku direction. So very same may happen here also. It's it's necessary to wait for a day or two and we will see how the situation develops. But anyway, Vremovsky ledge is not even on the first, first line of uh, defense of Russian forces. That is most important, uh, I believe. Uh, it's uh, third month of this so-called Ukrainian counteroffensive and basically they did not even manage to reach uh, first line of defense when it comes to Donetsk direction it's uh, mainly mainly still operational pause because we don't see large-scale offensive uh, operations from any one side but local scale skirmishes definitely are taking place and uh, it's uh, Russian forces that are on offensive 
in direction of Marinka, in direction of Krasna uh, Stara Mikhailovka, also in direction of Krasna Gorovka. Uh, this map is difficult to use, man. It's hard to read. So this is, by the way, Marinka here, which is almost uh, under full Russian control, but still there is some 5 to 10 percent of the settlement that controlled by Ukrainian forces. This is Krasnogorovka, also a hot point, and the Russian side is uh, constantly conducting local scale offensive operations in this uh, area. Also, Avdevka, of course, of, of course, also Avdevka, which is uh, partially encircled. Uh, this uh, this settlement and uh, and even though initiative is in, on, on on Russian side and we are seeing constant this local scale offensive operation, still nothing is happening in the scale that will influence overall situation on this sector of the front of the front line. I believe uh, I believe as I said quite a few times before, once the situation will finally resolve with this uh, Ukrainian so-called counteroffensive. After that, shortly Russian forces will become much more active on Donetsk sector, on Donetsk sector of the front. Also, when it comes to a Bakhmut uh, direction, as I said before, initiative totally is in Russian hand on the northern sector of the front, on the south, on the northern flanks of the Bakhmut, on the southern flanks of the Bakhmut. And even though Ukrainian units are time after time sent uh, for con to conduct. Um, this frontal suicidal offensive uh, operations, they are not really managing to achieve anything. And as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, in in area of uh, Klishchevka, for example, Ukrainian forces all lost almost uh, all the positions that they uh, they managed to uh, control, establish control in previous uh, uh, three to four weeks of battles. With, uh, with with heavy heavy casualties so initiative yet again is in is in russian hands and without uh, additional reinforcements in this direction i don't think ukrainian forces have enough uh, strength to conduct successful successful uh, local scale offensive operations or even hope for success and i mean uh, both flanks of the bakhmut northern and uh, southern one and when it comes to when it comes to our northern sectors of the front from uh, Seversk to Kupiansk, uh, well, it's uh, even though Russian forces still are moving forward, especially in Kupiansk direction. And by the way, just uh, yesterday I did uh, read some reports, uh, official reports from uh, uh, Defense Ministry, I believe it was, that uh, in Kupiansk direction. At, uh, at certain areas of the front, Russian forces did manage to move forward during the battles in previous uh, couple of weeks from 11 to 15 kilometers, which is uh, quite a uh, quite significant, uh, quite significant su success. Uh, but uh, yet again, yet again, uh, um, I believe even though Russian forces are ready in my reading of big picture to conduct large scale offensive operations in the northern uh, sectors of the front um, well uh, uh, it's hard to tell but uh, well probably they will receive green light for offensive before end of this summer but as time goes by i'm beginning to have some doubts about it uh, even though there was many reports many reports even from the front line that uh, on this sector that Russian forces, they are uh, well prepared to conduct a large scale offensive operation. But who knows what kind of plans Russian defense ministry and general staff has. I would not be surprised if we will see large scale offensive in central and northern sectors of the front before end of this summer. But yet again, as time goes by, I'm beginning to doubt that uh, this uh, large-scale uh, offensive will take place. Anyway, this is a this is a quick uh, summary, short summary of the situation on the front line. Uh, how long is this video? It's 29 minutes. Okay, five minutes. I will I will share with you a few more news. And by the way, later on, probably I will 
make a second update for this main channel also and i will share all the other news because i want to begin making short videos like 30 35 minutes uh, because many of you many of you did uh, ask about it and uh, I'm, I'm listening it so so let's go through some of the headlines stas news agency is reporting that uh, former russian president and uh, current deputy chairman of uh, security council uh, in in russia Dmitry medvedev did uh, make the statements about uh, Uh, about conflict in uh, Ukraine and he also remember uh, remember uh, conflict with Georgia in 2008 and he said that um, Russia will uh, definitely manage to achieve peace like it did in 2008 in uh, in Georgia of course very different uh, conflicts very different scale uh, we cannot compare uh, in, in, in many ways, but uh, Medvedev was a president of Russia in 2008 and Putin was prime minister at the at the time. So it's understandable that Medvedev is, is seeing some parallels between the conflicts and uh, well, uh, I don't think uh, many people have any doubts that uh, eventually Russia will of course emerge victorious from this conflict in Ukraine between Russia and um, so-called Western elites. And by the way, uh, head of Russian parliament, Russian state Duma, Vyacheslav Volodin also did remember conflict in 2008 between Russia and Georgia. And he said that Zelensky will share fate of Saakashvili. And by the way, as, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, right now that war criminal and mass murderer Saakashvili, Mikhail Saakashvili, is in Georgian prison. And, uh, well, it will be uh, fully justified if, if, if Saakashvili will stay in Georgian prison for life. That's how many crimes he did committed against Georgia, against Georgian society, against Ossetian society, against Russia. He should be in jail for life and all his associates also that were one way or another involved in in provoking that conflict in 2008 and many of them by the way are are all free and calling themselves oppositions and they of course are controlled by washington and they are constantly trying to destabilize georgia until now even now by the way and i uh, i don't understand why current georgian government is so soft towards these criminals i will never understand that but anyway let's uh, let's continue they are danger for georgia by the way those so-called opposition leaders that were part of saakashvili's regime in 2008 they are uh, main danger for georgia georgian citizens georgian statehood i'm 100 percent sure about it let's continue and reinvest is reporting that uh, in Kherson uh, region, Ukrainian forces did uh, conducted uh, try to conduct did try to conduct landing operation as I just uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, and this was reported by uh, Vladimir Saldo, head of uh, Kherson region, gov governor of this uh, region, and according to him, none of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, soldiers did made it to left bank, and uh, the speedboats that they were using was. Um, uh, destroyed uh, let's uh, continue and by the way this is quite interesting news also Rianost is reporting that uh, aid of uh, Zelensky and one of the most influential figures in uh, modern Ukraine Mikhail Padalyak did made a statement that uh, Ukraine is against any scenario of ceasefire so as you remember a few days ago in Saudi Arabia, there was a, a meeting with uh, um, full or partial involvement of some 30 countries. And that meeting, main topic of, of meeting was uh, Ukraine and, and peace in Ukraine. And uh, some statements were made after, uh, after that um, conference did talk place. And some media outlets even did report that uh, uh, Ukrainian side did agree uh, on some proposals 
uh, from uh, from participants of that uh, that conference how ceasefire could be achieved or how negotiations could be gone between or should be gone between Russia and and uh, Ukraine. But yesterday late afternoon we see this statement from uh, Podolyak and uh, I believe he's talking he speaks um, with uh, you know he speaks the words of uh, Zelensky himself. He is a Zelensky said. And he's saying that uh, Ukraine, for Ukraine, it's uh, mm, Ukraine would not consider ceasefire under any uh, circumstances, under any scenario, which is, uh, well, you tell me how crazy is that. But yet again, uh, this news once again highlights that Moscow is in a truly difficult uh, position here because uh, there is nobody in Ukraine to talk to. Uh, words and uh, and statements and even signed documents by Zelensky's regime means absolutely nothing. Zero. Not even zero, by the way. So I believe uh, Moscow not really have any other choice other than uh, continue the special military operation and establish control over the entire Ukraine. Maybe with exception of Western regions, if there are some negotiations between Moscow and Warsaw or some other and some other uh, capitals of neighboring states with Ukraine about that Western Ukrainian regions, which may be, by the way, there may be some negotiations. Uh, about uh, Western Ukraine. But as I said quite a few times before, uh, my belief is that after this conflict will end, um, there will be no more Ukraine as a state left on the political map. None. Because, uh, and one of the reasons is that uh, Moscow hardly will see anybody in current regime in Kyiv that are worthy enough to speak to or, tr or or can be trusted let me continue and uh, by the way how long is this it's 37 minutes so i'm gonna end uh, this update here Ria Novosti, this news is about abram stanks Ria Novosti is reporting that us washington basically did green light to militaries to deliver and pentagon did green uh, give a green light uh, to deliver uh, Abrams uh, main battle tanks to Zelensky's regime we all uh, knew about it and according to some reports uh, this Abrams US made uh, Abrams tanks will uh, end up in Ukraine somewhere in September but uh, uh, let's let's wait and see these tanks not not gonna play any crucial or significant role really on the battlefield they will be destroyed as a, as, as leopard tools are for example so i will i will end this uh, update here and by the way as i said um, later on later on i will uh, i will record another update not just for patreon but also for these main channels on youtube and rumble and uh, i will share in that updates la latest uh, uh, news that will be reported by russian media for that uh, exact moment this is it for now. I hope you will find this uh, update uh, interesting. And if so, please uh, please hit that like button, leave some commentary about any topic uh, you like. More likes and uh, comments definitely do influence uh, algorithm and uh, gives me opportunity to reach wider audience. And uh, for the very same reason, if you can please share links to my videos with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, or any other platform that you are active on. and. Uh, if you think this channel is interesting, useful, informative and deserves to exist in this field of news and political commentary, please um, consider to support with small donations through PayPal, buy me a coffee or by subscribing to my Patreon. You will see links under this video in the description box or in the pinned comment. This is it for now. Um, have a great day and take care.